Greetings. This is the commentary on the song, I Found My Work. I have a lot of songs that I really, really like, uh, but this is one of the top shelf ones. Not only because of the music, but because of the message in it. It seems like the climax of the song would be, you showed me how to live, you showed me how to die. Such knowledge of the Christ of God is too high. I can't attain to the high calling found in your name. Apart from you, I am blind, wretched, and lame. But the actual climax of the lyrics to this song is in the very last line. I found my work to proclaim another's. Why would that be the climax of this song lyrically for me? Well, let's step back a moment and I want to talk about the American culture, our culture. When we come up and there's a little kid that is there and we meet, first thing we usually ask is, what's your name? Well, that's easy to answer. Johnny. Susie. How old are you? Three. Four. Third question is usually, what do you want to be when you grow up? If you can't answer that question, and as you continue to grow up, and that question remains unanswered, particularly for males, I believe it creates, at least it did for me, a lot of internal pressure. I was always very good in school and had all this potential, and I could be this, I could be that, I could be anything. But as I'm getting closer and closer to having to make decisions educationally or what do I want to do, that pressure. I wanted to escape it, and the easiest way is through substance abuse where you're only thinking present tense, whether you're thinking right or not, is almost irrelevant because the main thing is you're not thinking about something that's bringing additional pressure on you. My mother recently died, but in this last five years I've been able to spend quite a bit of time with her, and I shared with her some of these early adult struggles. She didn't know why I got into the things I got into, and I said, well, Mom, the reason is when somebody doesn't like what they're thinking about, you look for some kind of escape. And I have a nephew that's involved in drones and satellite uh, work in Huntsville, Alabama. And I said, you don't have to worry about Casey, is his name, being enticed by mind-altering drugs in his body because he likes what he's thinking about. When people do not like what they're thinking about, they look for some kind of escape hatch so they don't have to think about it, at least for a while. Of course, the trap is it's a, it's a, it's a cycle that, that, that no solution comes, and that type of abuse creates its own problems. But see, also another thing is when I would think about what do I want to be when I grow up, it's like, okay, to be a lawyer or to be a scientist of some sort, to go through the rigors and education, for what? To live 40 years longer, if you're lucky, and retire or die? What's the point? Well, some would call that negative thinking, but I've called it realistic thinking. What is the point? What is the purpose of life? Why go through these rigors? Why not just rather find things of pleasure and just live your life out in pleasure? The beauty of this song is it is about Jesus Christ. Some things he did, he gave everything for me. Shouldn't I give everything for you? But then the song is also about me and putting me in my proper role. Mutually compatible, mutually sound. Kenosis theology is a debate on what all God, the second person of the Godhead, laid aside when he entered human history as an infant and then grew up as a child and then as a man. What all did he lay aside? So I'm saying he gave everything for me, not only in terms of giving up his position in terms of glory for a season, but also he gave everything for me in that physically, when he was killed, 
I believe that Jesus was in the pinnacle of his physical life, top-notch condition. He had been walking for three or three and a half years, the environs of Israel. In fact, I would not be surprised if we find that when Jesus was crucified, that he may have been the most solid physical individual that's ever existed in this age, as far as after the fall, in top-notch condition. In other words, that it took the maximum amount of pressure on that physical body to squeeze the life out of it. You remember in the garden he said, why have you come out against me like a thief? Wasn't I in the temple daily teaching? You didn't grab me then. But this hour and the power of darkness is yours, has been given to you. God the Father gave that hour of darkness to Satan for Satan to do whatever he wanted to do to extract that physical life out of that body. He could not break any of the bones. That's where the beatings and the scourging and the crucifixion were designed to bring the maximum amount of pressure and to draw it out as long as possible with the sole goal of getting Jesus to sin at some point in that process. So you gave everything for me, shouldn't I give everything for you? When Jesus was given to these soldiers, they were probably as intimidating and malicious of humans as you would probably ever encounter. And if you can put yourself in that place, do you remember Jesus said, do not fear those who can kill the body, but after that there's no more they can do to you? Rather, I will tell you, I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him whom, after he's killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. I think when Jesus was subject to those soldiers, he practiced what he preached, and he wasn't afraid of them. And I almost feel certain that they knew that. Maybe the centurion that witnessed Jesus' death, even though there's the earthquake and everything else, maybe part of it was he saw the way that Jesus did not fear them. And that may have had a, as great an impact shaking his soul as that earthquake shaking his body. There's no way I would be able to endure the kind of physical trauma that he took. And I wouldn't be able to last as long as him because my body's not in the kind of condition that his was in. When I come to the second verse, I'm a little conflicted in that when I talk about the disciples, it says, uh, I would never wash the feet of sinful men who I knew would desert me that same night when I most needed them. That, when I most needed them, one time I had it written in there, cowardly, faithless men. Because I started thinking that it made Jesus look weak, that he needed them and they deserted him. When the truth is, he already told them, look, all of you are going to desert me, but I won't be left alone because the Father who is always with me will be with me. So he didn't really need them. And in truth, I've got an article called The Necessity of Spiritual Independence. And I make the case that we need to develop a relationship with God to where there are some realities that we must face all by ourselves. Nobody can come in and help us. And the one we need is God himself to be our friend. He's who we really need. So we can have all kinds of friends. We can have all kinds of people patting us on the back. But when it comes right down to us, they can't help us in our truest, most basic, most emergency times of need. It can only come from God himself. Well, Jesus obviously would have known that better than any of us. So that particular phrase I've, I've always been a little uncomfortable with. But when I get to Malchus, I'm not uncomfortable with that because I would never, I could never, I would never replace the ear of a slave who would come to take me to a cross and to my grave. It's interesting that John identified him by name. And um, even though John was written pretty late, Malchus may have still been around. And to use that specific name, that he could be tracked down and this story verified if anybody wanted to do that.
felt the need to do it. Malchus, did you really have your ear cut off and he healed it in the garden? And the fact that John uses his name, I hope that's a good indicator that Malchus um, responded. I've got a song called And Rejoice. And I talk about when you were in the garden of betrayed trust. Did Malchus hear your voice and rejoice? Boy, I hope he did. One phrase in this is I say, share your reality instead of all this surrounding insanity. Insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives and afterwards they go to the dead. People walk around in insanity. They have little kingdoms in their own chest, I think is the way John Calvin put it. Everything revolves around that individual. Uh, the Bible is so um, interesting and at one hand he'll say, if any man thinks himself to be something, being nothing, he deceives himself. Well, of course, the flip side is the fact that God became a man, entered human history to pay for our sins, to die for us, and then is bringing us to himself and is going to raise us in a new body, an immortal body, in the new heavens and a new earth. It's evidently we must be worth something. But in and of ourselves, thinking ourselves to be something, being nothing, we deceive ourselves. The Bible is just so beautiful and how it just... Um, will state the, the, the one thing like that, and then on the flip side of it, how incredibly valuable we are to Him. Being surrounded by insanity, to me, it's just stunning as I continue to live of how sin has had such a tremendously negative impact upon our morality and upon our thinking ability and upon our will. People get to the point of calling evil good and calling good evil. That's been around from the beginning. For example, in our current political system, people on the left, basically the Democrat Party, are fools spiritually in the things of God. But it's amazing how they are also, as far as worldly wisdom, fools as well. They don't understand how men are motivated. They're dangerous. Our country is at risk because of these people. And that's where we're needing people, whether they're spiritually wise or not. I want worldly wise people in there to understand the dangers of man in this condition and in this age and do things to protect ourselves from the insanity of other groups that are bent on power takeovers and, and their own weird theologies and political leanings, etc. One of the great hopes that we have as a Christian is deliverance from this. I also want to have a couple versions of this song. I want to have a simpler version of it because my oldest daughter likes that best. But I really love some of these harmonies my youngest daughter has done. My oldest daughter said she, she doesn't think it fits because my youngest daughter has such a polished voice. And it's also like she said, it's like she's up close to the microphone where it's polished and it's clean. And I'm more back from the microphone and it's rougher and grainy kind of. But the more I listen to my youngest daughter with these harmonies, it's because it was so misfitting that it had its own art to it. It's like its own painting. And so I'm going to do both versions. Even though my youngest daughter doesn't really want me to do it, I'm still going to do it version anyway and maybe she'll do a complete version I don't know but just know that all of my songs they can either be just the guitar itself and you can put lyrics to it or it can be the guitar and my lyrics and then whatever percussion and other musical instruments around it if you've got that kind of knowledge and desire and expertise and etc so I just want to go ahead and close and close like I always do because you know like I always say 